All right. Um, up next, we have Francis Rangers from the United States Geological Survey. All right, thanks everybody. Um, it's really great to be here, um, see all the presentations. I'm just kidding. I'm just gonna skip the outline. <laughs> okay, so here's where I wanna start. Um, just wanna remind everybody, you know, the last few days we've really talked so much about um, what's been happening in the Pacific Northwest in 2020, and I just wanted to remind everybody about um, how bad a fire year 2020 was globally. Um, so I thought I'd start there. Um, so January of 2020, um, there were huge uh, fires in Australia. Um, here's a picture of a community where people had to be evacuated to a beach uh, to be evacuated by boat because they couldn't travel overland. Um, in California, um, you had five of the six largest fires in state history. In Colorado, we had three different fires that were all larger than the largest historical fire. Um, in 2020, so it was just a, a pretty bad year. And then, um, obviously, um, as everybody here knows, um, the Labor Day fires in 2020 um, here in Oregon were really devastating. Um, they were caused by this uh, omega block um, climatic system, and I'm not a meteorologist, so I had to look on Google to figure out what that was. <laughs> but I'll show you guys a picture of that, because um, I think understanding this climate pattern actually might be really important. Um, but uh, like people have said the past few days, this was driven by east winds. Um, and hazard-wise, there were 40,000 people that had to be evacuated. Um, so it was really uh, just devastating from a sociological point of view. Um, and all told, it burned 11% um, of the Oregon Cascades. So here's a picture um, of that Omega block. Um, and this is a really interesting weather pattern. Um, it's a high separated by these two cutoff lows. And um, what was crazy about when this was happening um, in the rest of the country, um, this is kind of, this map kind of shows what it looked like. So the rest of the country, uh, mid-continent was getting really cold, um, whereas, you know, it was burning like crazy um, in Oregon. And um, it was personally meaningful for me because I had a really nice dinner outside on Monday night of Labor Day. It was warm, and the next day it snowed a foot in my house. <laughs> um, it was just a, a really crazy weather transition. So the question is, you know, why was there so much fire in 2020? Um, and the really quick answer that I'm gonna say is it was really hot and really dry. Um, so what I want to talk to you all about um, is uh, debris flows generally, and I wanted to start by talking about a sort of subgenre, which is runoff generated debris flows. So to think about this, let's start by thinking about um, just a normal forest. So this is a picture of a forest in California, um, and you know, in a forested environment, when it rains, um, that raindrop falls, it hits leaves and needles um, in the canopy. Um, then it hits litter and duff on the forest floor. And so if we compare that with a burned landscape, all of a sudden that same rain, um, it doesn't hit as many things on the way down because um, there are no uh, needles or, or leaves left um, in high burn severity areas at least. Um, and then there's no litter and duff left on the forest floor. Um, so it just hits the ground. And I wanna show you what it looks like um, when you have high um, soil uh, burn severity and hydrophobicity. So let's see. So here's uh, a video. Um, this is me in a burn area and I've scraped off um, ash. So we're just pouring water right on the soil. And you can see that it pulls up and runs right off. <laughs> um, just doesn't even take any, yeah, any time to infiltrate. Um, so, you know, this is a the kind of soil burn severity that we're concerned about um, when it's just extremely highly water repellent. Oops. Um, the other thing that happens is all the elements that make soils cohesive um, tend to be destroyed at about 100 degrees C. So um, fine roots, 
bacteria and fungi. Um, even clays uh, at about 100 degrees C, they can swell and crack and they can lose some of their cohesion. Um, so that makes soils easier to erode when they've been heated. Um, and in this case, this uh, is an example of a picture of runoff generated debris initiation. So um, th there's not hardly any vegetation on the site. You have rilling, you have uh, water that's not going in and it's um, rapidly eroding soil. And so that kind of creates this general recipe or equation that, that basically in areas after fire, often when you have less infiltration, um, and more easily erodible soils, you certainly get trans sediment transport and you might get a uh, runoff generated debris flow. And just to put it in a hazards perspective, um, the, you know, from uh, infrastructure and life safety point of view, um, we're really concerned because these debris flows can have a big impact on communities. So here's an example from Montecito, California. Um, you can see a house that's buried up to its eaves in gigantic boulders. Um, this was a car um, in that same neighborhood. And you can see other houses in the background um, that are just completely buried uh, in boulders. And um, this has definitely been seen in Oregon. So uh, our very own Sarah Wall has led this paper um, where she showed the impact to infrastructure and this road here um, from a runoff generated debris flow. Um, a, another big concern is the impact of debris flows on uh, water resources. So here what you're looking at is a debris flow. It came out of a watershed. It went underneath a railroad trestle um, and it blocked about three quarters of the Colorado River. So that's the, the general processes of post-fire debris flows. Um, now I want to introduce you to um, the USGS uh, likelihood model, it's an empirically based um, logistic regression model, and just tell you how we typically um, try and predict um, runoff, generate, runoff generated debris flows. So this is an example of the hazard map um, that we uh, create in, in my group. Um, it has two elements really. There are polygons um, for the basins and there are stream segments. And um, if you look at the legend, you can see that the, the polygons and the stream segments are colored um, by a probability. The maximum basin size um, is eight square kilometers. Um, so these are actually really small. And the reason it's eight square kilometers is because the original data set used to um, develop the model for these uh, equations is the, the maximum uh, size that we had in the data set was eight square kilometers. Um, this empirical model is based on 1,550 observations and it contained exactly zero observations from the Pacific Northwest. <laughs> so that's a, a very big problem and it's something um, that we're actively trying to work um, to, to ameliorate. So here's um, the framework of lo the logistic regression equation. And the main things that I just want to point out are the four elements that go into it. It's basically how steep is it? So that's the terrain. Um, how uh, burned was it? That's the severity. Um, and then uh, how erodible are the soils? And, and we just get this estimate, the KF factor from the soil survey. Um, and then the final element is the rain. And that's sort of the, the input um, that we don't know uh, going in ahead of time. And so Bill earlier showed this very same figure um, to indicate how we're trying to um, use this empirical model to create a rainfall threshold. So basically, um, if you look at the plot, um, what we're trying to do is fit this dashed line and get a rainfall intensity um, that hopefully can separate out um, runoff generated debris flows from just runoff. Another interesting part of this though is that um, we can take that equation, we can put in a probability of 50%, let's say, and we say, okay, what's the rainfall threshold um, that we need to have um, a 50% chance of triggering a debris flow? And so this is what we actually use um, to get our rainfall threshold. And if you wanna know more about it, you should talk with 
Brittany Sealander, because she has a poster on this, and she's actively thinking about this for her postdoc. Um, in terms of data collection, um, like Bill just showed, um, Dogami's done a lot to do uh, debris flow and flood response observations. Um, so that's been really huge, and just kind of showing basically what, what Bill just uh, showed. I just want to highlight that um, they went, Bill and Nancy went out, they collected um, a lot of data using ArcGIS Collector. Um, they took photos of observations of debris flows and runoff responses. Um, so that was really important. So um, that's one piece of the puzzle. Um, the second piece is understanding, tying that rain to those observations. Um, so that's gonna be kind of the, the second half of what I wanna tell you guys about today. So um, we've really benefited because um, folks from OSU, folks from uh, University of Oregon have set up rain gauges and have been really generous in sharing the data. Um, here's an example of a Ben Lashinsky uh, rain gauge setup. Um, but there's, there's a lot of other um, rain gauges that are already operational and we wanted to um, know what they were recording. Um, so uh, I've started to develop uh, some software with um, a really clever student intern we have <laughs> in our office. Um, here's our GitLab page and we call it uh, Flow Alert. And all it's doing is it's just making it easier for us to scrape data that already exists. Um, so I'm gonna walk you guys through um, this software that we're using and just kind of show you um, how we're trying to make our lives easier and, and if you wanna use it, um, you would be the second user <laughs> besides me. Um, but we'd love to try and share this with people um, to because we think it just makes it easier to interpret and use existing rainfall data. Um, so here's, here's an example from the Archie Creek fire. Um, we, the first thing we do, let's see, okay, there we go. Um, so I'm gonna show you some, my coding terminal. So the first thing we do is we just enter one line of code um, and all it says is um, run flow alert and add the Archie Creek fire. ACH 2020, that's our internal code. It goes to our website and pulls the shape file of the fire perimeter, um, and then it buffers it by four kilometers, um, which is kind of our um, internal distance threshold for looking for rain gauges. Um, and then it delivers us back all of the weather stations that are within that area. So it takes about 34 seconds for that one. So here's an example of the table um, that we have, and these are a bunch of red weather stations. You can see quite a few are inactive, um, so we're not gonna use those. So we have four stations um, that are active, and three of those have rainfall. The next step, um, now that we know where the stations are, um, we wanna pull down that raw data. So um, we just send command number two. We tell it, again, um, the fire that we're looking for is the Archie Creek 2020. We give it a start time and an end time. Um, and then it takes about 15 seconds. It now pulled down all the raw data from those uh, rain gauges. And so here's an example of what that data looked like. Um, there's, there are lots of fields, but we really care about the um, rainfall at each interval. And this is um, like five minute rainfall data. So it's pretty useful. All right, so then our third um, line of code that we're gonna do is gonna take that incoming rainfall data and process it into rainfall intensities because that's what we typically use um, as guidance. And the reason we use rainfall intensity is that in the past we've seen for runoff generated debris flows, it's really not the duration of the storm um, that seems to impact uh, the debris flow initiation, it's really the intensity. So for short, duration storms or long duration storms, whenever that intensity kicks up, that's when we see initiation. Um, that may not be the case in Oregon, but that's, that's kind of traditionally been uh, what we've seen in other places. So um, we run this code to process the data, and yeah, it's pretty simple. We just enter in the start time and end time again um, and give it a few commands like save the plots and save the data. And the output, 
looks like this. So we get uh, a plot that's an output. Um, here uh, we have dashed lines that show the USGS thresholds. Um, you can see different rainfall intensities, 15, uh, 30 minute, 60 minute. Um, interestingly here, um, none of them cross the threshold. There's also tabular data that sits behind that. So this is just the, this is just what we use to make the plot. Um, but those are the two outputs from our software. Um, and they give you, yeah, things like the, the 15 minute um, intensity as well as the threshold and it just tells you with a little flag, like either you crossed it or you didn't. So um, I just kind of want to show you guys some initial results that we got from this. Here's a map um, of um, the different fires from the 2020 uh, Labor Day event. And the little raindrop shows the location of these 42 rain gauges. Um, not all of the, those um, gauges were usable, even if they had rain, because sometimes they only had a resolution of 24 hours. Um, so we weren't able to use everything. And the points on here uh, are um, observations from Bill and Nancy. And the gauges weren't always super close to the observations. So this is the biggest problem. Um, so uh, for example here, looking at one single rain gauge in the Archie Creek fire, um, there was only one rain event that actually had an intensity higher um, than our threshold. So I'll just really quickly um, take you through some of the initial observations of the rainfall. Um, if we look at the first winter and just look at four of the sites, um, the maximum 60 minute rainfall is about 10, mil 10 millimeters an hour. I realize that's probably very hard to see in the back. Um, if we go to the summer, I broke out the summer um, storms as well. So same four plots, but now we're looking at the period from June 1st to uh, October 1st, 2021. Um, what was interesting to me is actually the, the maximum 60 minute rainfall isn't all that different than what we saw in the winter. It's 13 uh, millimeters an hour here. We also did this for 15 minute. Um, for the sake of time, I'm running a little over. Maybe I'll just skip these. Um, I'll kind of summarize this at the end. Um, we also looked at storms. So here each dot um, is a single storm um, and each color represents a separate rain gauge. And whenever they kind of stack on top of each other, we go, okay, a lot of rain gauges are seeing you know, big storms. Um, so we're able to kind of interpolate where some of the storms are happening. Um, so that's just for um, Archie Creek um, or yeah, Holiday Farm. And then here's the rest of them. And we see similar storms at, across some of the fires sometimes. And then, um, for example, like in Archie Creek, sometimes there's just kind of a lot of noise because it's just kind of rainy all the time. Um, but we identified about three storms that seem to be tied to some of the debris flow observations. Um, same thing can be done for the summertime, um, but what was, what's kind of interesting is it just didn't rain a whole lot that first summer, and, and that, yeah, that might be, just be kind of the typical pattern. Um, so the summary here is that 60-minute um, rainfall intensity, first uh, winter and first summer, the maximum values are actually kind of similar. Um, and if we look down at... Um, the 15 minute intensity, um, there is a big jump between summer and winter, but it's really just for one gauge. Um, the rest of the rain gauges are actually kind of similar between winter and summer for the first year. If we look at um, four debris flow observations, these were, <laughs> these, of all the observations, these were the four that were kind of close enough to a rain gauge. This is not that many. Um, but what we see is that um, the peak, whoops, the peak 60 minute um, rainfall intensities are you know, nine millimeters an hour, 10 millimeters an hour, five millimeters an hour. Um, and those are quite a bit lower than the USGS threshold. Um, so that tells us that, well, since we did observe something, that that threshold's maybe a little bit too high. Uh, maybe that the threshold should be lower uh, for Oregon. So uh, conclusions here, um, 
Flow Alert is something that we're using. Um, it allows us to get a snapshot of the rainfall relatively quickly. Um, year one, it seems like the USGS threshold might be a little too high um, in the Pacific Northwest. Um, and interestingly, the maximum summer and winter rainfall intensities aren't all that different. Um, so main conclusion, as I think the last few people have said, <laughs> is that we need um, you know, more rainfall observations and more observational data, because we'd really like to um, yeah, tie, tie things together. So I'll just leave it there. Thanks. Yeah, thanks for the talk. Um, this could go to uh, any number of you, but um, on the break, Aaron and I were talking about the role of freezing and thawing, those freeze-thaw cycles. So do you think that, you know, that, of course, we've had a lot of cold weather here, freezing lately. Um, do you think that, that that might contribute to more slides this year? That's a great question. You know, one area that I've personally seen freezing and thawing contributing is um, helping to load channels. So it can, you have know, things freeze thaw and it helps to load channels with sediment. Um, so I, I wouldn't be surprised if that was part of it. Um, yeah. Um, back to the first speaker. Um, have you looked, thought about large root decay? That was pretty well established as uh, for post clear cut slides and debris flow as the dominant factor. And uh, the anecdotal story was that 15 years after clear cut in the, on the west side is when the uh, soil would cut loose. Um, so large roots are what holds the slope together. Have you been looking at that at all? We're relying on Ben Lashinsky to, to guide us with his uh, data collection. So. Yeah, hopefully his results really kind of help us with that. Okay, and, and for you, um, the clays are held together mainly by organic matter, sir, absorbed on the, um, accumulating on the surfaces of the clays, and post during a real fire, like this, the places you were showing where the, the uh, soil has clearly been burnt, that organic matter is gone. So that's something else I think you should be thinking about. If you, have you been? Uh, aware of that and uh, yeah yeah no that's a great point yeah like I said um, yeah when you get to about 100 degrees C um, so it's become a lot more erodible um, what's interesting is that it's really hard to propagate temperature really hot temperatures very deeply so you don't propagate 100 degrees centigrade yeah and beyond about 10 centimeters yeah but that's as you showed that's that's where the um, that's where the, uh, the change occurs and the flow, uh, the, the surface flow starts. So that, that's what's important. Okay, thank you. That's a great question. Yeah, that's something that we thought a little bit about. Dipped our toe in the water just a teeny bit last summer. Um, it was really, it wasn't the reanalysis, it was just looking at radar. Um, and what was interesting was that one by one square kilometer grid cell, sometimes it agreed really well with our observations. Sometimes it was off by a couple grid cells, and we kind of interpreted that as being um, wind. You know, so if yeah, the radar is happening pretty high in the atmosphere, by the time that translates down, it's drifted a little bit. Um, so it was a little hit or miss. Um, so I think we're still pretty um, excited about on the ground rain gauges, but yeah, really to move forward 
integrating some radar and, and having knowing what the uncertainty is between the observation and what's happening on the ground, I think is where we need to go. So great, great suggestion.